Good evening and welcome to episode 7 of our Drawing Your Paths of Success video series for the 2023-2024 Big Game Draw. This is the last video in this series. Uh, I'm Darren Vaughn, the Communications Director for the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. I'm here tonight with uh, Nicole Tatman, our Big Game Program Manager. And she's here to talk about uh, Barbary Sheep, Ibex, Oryx, and Javelina. Um, so, uh, obviously we're coming right up on that deadline. Uh, March 22nd, 5 o'clock, is the big game draw deadline. And also the deadline for harvest reports for deer, elk, pronghorn, and turkey. Uh, you have to get those in or your draw applications will be rejected. Um, the harvest report deadline for Barbary, Ibex, Oryx, Javelina, and for Trapper license holders is April 7th. Uh, for those of you curious about the status of various species here in the state, uh, our hunt forecasts are all available on our magazine site. That's magazine.wildlife.state.nm.us. So uh, check those out as you're uh, filling out those final uh, draw applications. So without further ado, um, Nicole, um, what's new in 2023-2024 for uh, Oryx hunters here in New Mexico? Um, so we have a couple of changes since this is a new um, rule cycle. We'll have quite a few changes to run through for a variety of species, including orcs. So we have more off-range licenses. Those are increased by about 20%, so more mm -hmm. chances for folks to put in for off-range tags. We also increase licenses on-range. So those are usually the once-in-a-lifetime licenses or broken horn licenses. Those were also increased by 10%. We also have a new off-range hunt specifically for folks age 70 and older, so mm -hmm. um, that's a new change since last season. Um, there's also no longer the Iraq and Afghanistan hunt. Um, rather, that has now changed to a New Mexico veteran-only hunt, so mm -hmm. it's open to all New Mexico veterans now. Mm -hmm. um, we also made a change for um, the youth hunt, and we have designated those youth hunts as once in a youth, so a youth can draw it one time during their youth period, but then once they become an adult, they can draw the once in a lifetime tag. Mm -hmm. So, some uh, pretty pretty exciting changes. Yeah, in the yeah, orcs. more licenses is exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, what is the history of orcs in New Mexico? Um, you know, how did they get here, and where are they most typically found around here? So, the in the nineteen sixties and seventies, the commission was interested in introducing species, exotic species, into what was then vacant ranges. And so there were some parts of the state where they thought we can have a sustainable population of a variety of exotic species. So they went through the process of trying to identify what species would actually establish in New Mexico. And so Oryx was one of those that they considered could possibly be established in the state. And so um, Oryx were brought over. Um, the Albuquerque Zoo actually helped us raise some of them. We moved some of those Oryx to our Red Rock um, high fence facility down in the southeastern part, southwestern part of the state. Mm -hmm. Right now we have desert bighorn sheep there, but uh, we sort of propagated oryx there, determined that they actually were going to survive in the New Mexico climate, and so mm -hmm. they um, that's where they were started. Their progeny could be released into the wild, but the individuals themselves that were brought over had to stay mm -hmm. in that high fence facility. So right now, um, but back in the 70s, we decided to release with in conjunction with White Sands Missile Range, release animals on the missile range. Mm -hmm. And so that still remains their stronghold today. Most of the orcs in New Mexico are found on the missile range itself. Um, and they since kind of spilled over to the, the game management units that surround White Sands Missile Range. So for those off-range orcs hunters, I would suggest hunting in the adjacent areas that just border the missile range itself. Mm -hmm. And how many oryx are there here now? Um, and is that number increasing? Is it decreasing? Or is it just kind of holding steady right now? We estimate there are about four to 6,000 oryx in the state of New Mexico. Um, it has increased slightly in recent years. Um, and as a result, we have some increased licenses both on and off range. So um, we, we have a desire, the department has a desire to manage oryx to be maintained on White Sands Missile Range. Um, we don't really want to see them expand further than where they currently are. We know that there are orcs off range, which is why we have hunts there, um, but we don't have a desire to have them increase further across the state. Uh -huh. So they're, they're not going to be spread all over the boot heel or anything? Like yeah, that. no. <laughs> no. That is not the goal. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, so what are some of the different types of oryx hunts that are available? And also, you, you mentioned uh, White Sands Missile Range. For, for people who draw those hunts, what are some of the things that they need to do to, to, to make those hunts happen? I, I know that there's some background check stuff that they yeah. need to go through. Yeah, so um, I guess we'll go through the, the two different kinds of hunts are on-range and off-range hunts. Mm -hmm. So the on-range hunts um, are once-in-a-lifetime hunts. A lot of them are. So you can draw them once in your lifetime. We also have New Mexican, New Mexico veteran hunts now, um, new this year. We have broken horn hunts. So broken horn hunts are for folks. Anybody can apply for those. But if you've already drawn your once in a lifetime, that's the only other one on range that you can put in for. Mm -hmm. And we also, we also have some youth hunts and injured service member hunts. So those are the variety of hunts that are on range. Um, once folks draw the on range tag, Somebody from White Sands contacts them. Um, you have to go through a background check with you and your hunt party. You're only allowed a certain number of people to go with you on your hunt. It's a really secure area, so they they have uh, a lot of a lot of security to go through. So mm -hmm. when you're when you access the missile range, there's a process of checking in and checking out for your hunt each day. Um, you also in the in the process of getting that license and running your background check, um, doing all of that paperwork. They charge a hundred and fifty dollar uh, fee per hunter, so that gets all of that paperwork out of the way and, and helps them do that administrative work that they have to do. Mm -hmm. So for off range hunts, there is no additional fee. That's only the fee that is that the department charges for those licenses. Mm -hmm. We have regular hunts, so those are for anybody who can put in for for them. There's no um, broken horn limits for for the off range hunts. Uh, we also have youth hunts and now a new hunt for folks who are 70 and older, and mm -hmm. that's in February. So what, what's new coming up in this uh, license here for people hunting Barbary sheep? Yeah, so Barbary sheep, we have eight um, rifle hunts now. It was five previously, and so we, we shortened the hunt length a bit. It was 14 days previously, now it's seven days to accommodate more hunters across the landscape in that time period. Um, so licenses have increased for Barbary sheep also, so folks will have a better chance of drawing those tags that you can draw. Um, all of Unit 34 is now in the over-the-counter area, so there's, there's draw tags for Barbary sheep, and then there's an over-the-counter uh, license that is unlimited for the areas outside of those draw hunts. Um, and so for that area, all of Unit 34 is now included in the over-the-counter area. Um, Previously, we had some desert bighorn sheep ranges closed to the over-the-counter tag, but those are now going to be open. We don't see a lot of Barbary sheep in our, in our desert bighorn ranges, in most of them, I should say. Um, but on the occasion that somebody sees one in desert bighorn country, um, we would like that animal to be able to be harvested. So um, we, made, we made that allowance this year. But folks that are hunting in desert bighorn ranges should really pay attention to um, the animal that they're pulling the trigger on because... Barbary sheep and bighorn sheep have some similarities, and there have been people that have accidentally shot a bighorn on a barbary tag. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a new bag limit for um, barbary sheep for female and immature animal, so that is on McGregor Range only, um, and licenses on McGregor Range have also increased significantly. A lot of that is, is a result of the, the increase in female immature, um, but the female immature bag limit is 18 inches for um, Barbary sheep now. Mm. And, and you mentioned maybe some of the confusion that happens between Barbary sheep and bighorn sheep. What are some of the more notable differences between those two species that you know if that that you can actually tell the difference between? Yeah, them? yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the main difference that I notice is Barbary sheep have um, long, shaggy fur on the front side of on their front legs. Mm -hmm. They look like chaps. People call them chaps and that's exactly what they look like. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the main difference that I can tell on Barbary sheep. Bighorn sheep have a white rump also and Barbary sheep do not. Mm -hmm. um, and folks that go out um, where those ranges can cross, I would suggest just looking at photos. You can familiarize yourself pretty well looking at a variety of photos and identifying whether it's a Barbary sheep or a bighorn sheep. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, draw hunts and over-the-counter hunts for Barbary. Uh, what, are, what are some of the, uh, the differences between those hunts and also when, when are some of the best times to go out and, and hunt Barbary? Yeah, um, so the diff 
The, the differences in the draw hunts and over-the-counter hunts, Barbary sheep are sort of concentrated in the southeastern part of the state in a handful of game management units. Mm -hmm. And so in those units, we are um, we're providing access with draw licenses. So it's you're generally going to have a higher chance of encountering Barbary sheep. Success rates are higher than compared with the over-the-counter license. The over-the-counter license still has, I would say, very decent success rates, um, but not quite as, as high as those draw tags. Um, so over-the-counter is... It's a full year-round season, so anybody, you know, starting at the beginning of the license year can purchase an over-the-counter Barbary license. I would suggest waiting until you know if you've drawn for your um, your draw Barbary before you purchase that. Uh, but you can hunt, you know, in the summer, in the fall, in the winter, and be picky if you'd like for a Barbary sheep. So you can hunt the entire state with the exception of those draw areas for mm -hmm. that over-the-counter tag you can't, cannot hunt those draw areas they're closed for you mm -hmm. um, and there's not i guess there's not really a best time to hunt barbary sheep mm -hmm. um, people use it as an a lot of the times they use that over-the-counter tag as a opportunity hunt mm -hmm. i you know i've heard people not like going out in the summertime to hunt barbary just simply because it's hot but i'd mm -hmm. say there's not really a, a best time to to hunt them so Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can definitely see the uh, going out, especially in the southern part of the state in, in the yeah. middle of the summer, not being the, the most desirable time to yeah, be outside. Yeah. For, it's not ideal for a human. Yeah, yeah that, that's for sure. Um, I, I'm one of those who would definitely prefer to be inside in the AC yeah. <laughs> during yeah. that time yeah. of year. Um, so how many Barbary sheep are here in New Mexico? And ha is that population increasing or decreasing or is it kind of holding steady? For Barbary sheep, we don't formally survey them with, you know, we don't do a helicopter survey like we mm -hmm. do for some other of our big game species. So we monitor their population using hunter harvest reports. Okay. Those are really important for us to gauge what a population is doing. And we found that when we know a certain population size um, and we, we, we track that with hunter harvest report, if hunter harvest success is increasing, and satisfaction ratings are increasing, the population is increasing as well. So that's how we keep our finger on the pulse of how the, the Barbary sheep population is doing. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a number that I can give you on how many are in the in the state necessarily, mm -hmm. but they're um, likely increasing slightly, so that's mm -hmm. why we've increased some licenses for Barbary sheep this mm -hmm. coming license year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely a, a promising sign when you're able to, to raise the number of available licenses. Yeah. Uh, so moving on to Ibex, um, what, what's new for Ibex hunters this year? Oh man, um, so we have some changes for Ibex. The population of Ibex has um, decreased in recent years and that is a result of some of our management actions. We wanted to decrease the Ibex population. In addition, we've had these really wide swings of Ibex numbers and licenses through time. Um, since IBEX were established in the, also in the 70s. So we've gone from four licenses to like 1,400 licenses. So we're trying to come to more of a, an even level or, or not have these really large swings in licenses. And so we've made an effort to sort of try and stabilize the I, IBEX population. Um, we've backed off this coming license year for female and immature um, IBEX. And we've also changed the definition of what a female immature IBEX is um, it used to be 15 inch horns and now we've raised that to 20 inch horns. Another challenge we have with the Ibex population is that their sex ratio is about one to one. So mm -hmm. for every female, there's a male. We don't really like seeing that in ungulate populations. Mm -hmm. We like to see more females than males. And so by increasing that horn um, limit for the female immature bag limit, we're probably, we're going to probably harvest some more males in there too. So the Ibex population, um, we're going to be surveying it in a few weeks, so I'll have more information on that at that point. But mm -hmm. um, other new things for Ibex, we have a once in a youth. So similar to Oryx, um, it, there's a once in a youth designation. So you can draw it once as a youth, and then another time you can draw it as an adult or for the once in a lifetime tag. Mm -hmm. Oh. Importantly, we've changed the definition of a muzzleloader. I'm sure everybody is very familiar mm -hmm. with that. And we have some <laughs> Ibex muzzleloader hunts, and uh -huh. so for those Ibex muzzleloader hunts, you'll have to use um, use a muzzleloader with open sights. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, definitely a, a major, major change, kind of yeah. across the board with yeah. that with that change to the muzzleloader hunts. Yes. So um, as far as the history of Ibex here in New Mexico, where, 
When did we bring them in and uh, where are they typically found now? Yeah, similar to Oryx, um, in the 60s and 70s, the department had a desire, uh, the commission at the time had a desire to uh, establish exotic species for hunting opportunity. And so Ibex was one of the one of the handful that actually stuck in New Mexico and is successfully has a population today. They are uh, found in the Florida Mountains, so that's south of Deming. When their population is higher, some of those males can disperse to adjacent ranges around the Floridas, but generally they're found on the Florida range, and that's where the department desires to keep them. Mm -hmm. We have some concerns with ibex, you know, dispersing to other ranges with desert bighorn sheep, and there's a disease issue that we don't we don't want to make a problem. So mm -hmm. we want to maintain ibex on the Florida range, and so licenses are set, and for that reason, to maintain mm -hmm. them there. And what, what are some of the key differences between uh, the, the draw and over-the-counter ibex hunts? Yeah, the draw hunts are, are for the Florida range where you're going to find pretty much all of the ibex in mm -hmm. the state of New Mexico. I, at this, right now, I don't recommend folks buy that over-the-counter ibex tag um, unless they know of an ibex outside of the Florida range. Mm -hmm. That is, that's used, that over-the-counter ibex tag is used as a management tool to address those wandering males that might right. get into desert bighorn ranges. And so if you don't know of an Ibex off of the Florida range, there's no reason to buy that tag. And it, it would be disappointing for you to do that. Yeah, like, uh, uh, unless you're wanting to spend a, a few days out hiking. And, sure, sure. <laughs> and not seeing any Ibex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and how's that Ibex population looking? Is it, uh, is it increasing, decreasing steady? It, it's decreased in the last few years, but that was on purpose um, just to maintain the ibex on the Florida range itself um, and to tor try and avoid those really large swings in licenses. So where we offer a lot of licenses and then a few, I'm sure hunters who have paid attention in the last, I don't know, five, six years on ibex, there are some large swings in licenses. So we're trying to mm -hmm. move away from that. Um, so right now the ibex population is probably steady. We're going to survey it here in a couple of weeks, so we'll have more information then. Um, yeah, so probably steady at this point, but we have a, a desire to increase it slightly, mm -hmm. although we don't want to remove all of the female immature licenses and let the population really skyrocket because it can do that. Mm -hmm. and, and again, like you were saying, kind of keeping them to the Floridas, mm -hmm. if, if you did let it explode, they would definitely be off of Florida they, before yeah. too much longer. Yeah. So as, as far as javelina, um, any big changes this year? Yeah, for javelina, we added a population management hunt option. So that's when you're putting in for your draw hunts, that's the fifth choice. So we didn't have that before, so that's going to be new. And I'd always mm -hmm. recommend people put in for the fifth choice if they're interested in hunting that species. Because you can always, you know, say you don't want to take that hunt and it's, it's no, you're not committed to it. But you get called after the fact if there is going to be. A population management hunt. We've also expanded some hunt areas to include some of our wildlife management areas for javelina and that's some of those um, WMAs are double E, River Ranch, Red Rock and so those are open now for hunters who hold a valid license for that game management unit. Um, we also increased the javelina licenses slightly so in the boot heel where most of the javelina are found we've increased licenses by 10 percent and the statewide licenses we've increased by 20 percent. So more to have, no more opportunity to go pursue javelina. Mm -hmm. So as far as a population estimate, how how is the javelina population looking and where, where are they typically found? Similar to Barbary sheep, we don't formally survey javelina, but we use mm -hmm. hunter harvest um, reports as a metric for how the population is doing. So we've, we've seen an increase in satisfaction ratings, success ratings from hunter harvest reports. And also reports of people seeing javelina in places that we haven't expected to see them, maybe further north. So um, we, the population is likely increasing, and so as a result, we've increased licenses there. And the stronghold really for javelina is the southern part of the state. That's where they're going to be mostly found, although we've been having reports further north than mm -hmm. we have in the past. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the southwestern part of the state, the boot heel, is um, really where the highest densities are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have heard of the odd javelina of El Dorado. Yeah, but um, yeah. That, he's that's a popular one. <laughs> yeah, that, 
Yeah, he's, he's popular, but he's also certainly rare. Yeah, yeah, he's rare. Yeah. <laughs> so what are some of the key differences between the, uh, the draw javelina hunts and the over-the-counter javelina hunts? The draw hunts for javelina are going to be concentrated in the boot heel where we have the highest densities of, mm -hmm. of javelina. Um, the over-the-counter hunt has, has a cap, so it's sort of different from the Barbary sheep over-the-counter where there is no cap for Barbary sheep. There is a cap for javelina and over-the-counter. And so with that over-the-counter license for javelina, you can hunt the areas outside of the draw areas. Mm -hmm. So southeastern New Mexico would be a good option for folks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, do you have any... Um... Any tips for people who may be hunting any of these species for the first time? Um, I My only suggestion would be to do your homework. Scout ahead of time if you can. Uh, if you can't scout in person, use some online, you know, aerial photos or something like Onyx to look to see where you might access places. In some cases, access might be an issue in the case for Barbary sheep, for example. So mm -hmm. planning ahead of time and doing some homework is, is really going to be key. And I, I say good luck to everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Nicole, for your time. And uh, hopefully that helps uh, some of you um, who are looking to apply for one of those exotic species or javelina in the upcoming draw. So once again, uh, that March 22nd deadline for uh, your big game draw applications is looming. Also for your deer, elk, pronghorn, and turkey harvest reports. Make sure you get those in or your, uh, your draw applications will be rejected. And obviously nobody wants to have that happen. Um, the harvest report deadline for Barbary, Ibex, Oryx, Javelina, and Trapper license holders is April 7th. Um, all of the other episodes in this series are available in the uh, Drawing Your Path to Success playlist on our YouTube account. And uh, yeah, if uh, you want to check any of those out as you're getting ready to apply for the draw, uh, feel free to, to look us up on YouTube and check that out. So, for Nicole Tatman, our cameraman Ryan Darr, uh, Liam Phillips who also helped us along the way, I'm Darren Vaughn, the Communications Director for the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. Thank you for watching the video series this year, and best of luck to you in the big game draw.